is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. When I got to Washington, I watched everything that that MJ did. I mean, whether it was, you know, walking in, you know, into his locker, you know, putting his stuff up, you know, having a seat um, to going into the training room to, you know, when he ate pregame, you know, what time he arrived at the arena, uh, what time, you know, how much time he allowed himself to to leave his apartment to arrive at the arena uh, to get his treatment. Um, what time he went out to the court to warm up. These are all the things that I'm, you know, just watching um, and, you know, just are, are locked inside of me that I had that experience to watch, you know, the greatest to ever do it, go through his process of, you know, of being a professional basketball player. Larry Hughes has played for the Philadelphia 76ers, Golden State Warriors, Washington Wizards, Cleveland Cavaliers, Chicago Bulls, New York Knicks, Sacramento Kings, Charlotte Bobcats, and the Orlando Magic. He was drafted by Philadelphia in the first round of the 1998 NBA draft out of St. Louis University, where he was named Freshman of the Year. He was recognized as a versatile and athletic guard with strong defensive abilities and was selected to the 2004-2005 NBA All-Defensive First Team as a member of the Wizards. He co-founded Basketball Training Systems in 2015 to fulfill his passion for teaching and developing basketball and life skills among the youth in St. Louis and other communities. Rick Campbell founded New Amsterdam Group, a private asset management firm which co-founded Basketball Training Systems with Larry Hughes. He has over 30 years of legal, investment banking, and wealth management experience. Prior to founding New Amsterdam, Rick was the president of a large multinational single-family office with operating companies in several countries. Rick started his career as a corporate finance lawyer, during which he was involved in several initial public offerings, mergers, acquisitions, project finance, and corporate development projects. For several years following his tenure as a corporate finance lawyer, Rick was involved in building and selling several companies in a variety of industries. If you have a chance to leave us a five-star rating and review on your favorite podcast app, we would really appreciate it. Tell your friends in the coaching community about the show, and make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. Check out hoopheadspod.com where you can listen to every episode we've ever recorded and find out more about what drives our show. You're going to want to take plenty of notes as you listen to this episode with former NBA player Larry Hughes and his basketball training systems business partner, Rick Campbell. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Quinzing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome a duo from basketball training systems, Larry Hughes, former NBA player, and Rick Campbell. Guys, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having us. Yeah, we're excited to have you guys on, talk a little bit about, Larry, your career as an NBA player, and then also dive into all the great things that you have guys you guys have going with basketball training systems. So we'll dive into that piece of it a little bit later. Right now, Larry, let's start by going back to when you were a kid and talk a little bit to us about how you got into the game of basketball when you were younger. Uh, well, obviously, it started you know, in the schoolyard. It started in the playgrounds of just playing unorganized basketball, um, you know, traveling, double dribble, you know, all that, that good stuff. And just really <laughs> uh, having a good time with basketball, you know, just getting a group of friends uh, together and just playing basketball. Really um, the motivation to stay out of trouble, you know, and stay with a group that's, um, you know, instead of running the streets, we were on the on the on the playground. Um, so that that when I was 12. Uh, my mom got me into organized basketball, which, you know, she actually took me to a gym that had some coaches um, and it was actually at a church. Um, and from there, um, you know, all the skills pretty much transferred. I mean, playing on the playground, you use a lot of, you know, juke moves and things of that nature. So the playground basketball actually transferred into, you know, it, it, into the gym, into organized basketball. And, and at 12 years old, uh, I took a liking to the game. I had some really good coaches, some educators uh, starting out, a uh, principal, a school teacher, uh, and, a, and a school uh, security uh, guy. Um, they were my, you know, my first coaches, and I, I think it's a blessing for me to have those guys uh, be my first coaches because I just accepted the game. I accepted the coaching. I, I love the environment, um, and it was something that I wanted to continue to do, and I would show up you know, twice a week, uh, and eventually I got better uh, and better. And had the opportunity to play on some really good teams uh, growing up, teams that traveled, 
um, to different parts of the country playing basketball, um, being in different environments. Um, you know, I'm an inner city kid, so I had the chance to just be around people that I didn't normally see, um, you know, and understand how, you know, how basketball kind of connects. I kind of learned that at, at, a, at a very young age and, you know, just took the game and I, and I ran with it because I, I enjoy it. So while you were getting into organized basketball, were you still spending a lot of time playing play, playing playground basketball as well in addition to the travel and some of the, some of the other opportunities that you got as a result of getting into organized uh, organized hoops? Oh, for sure. For sure. The playground is really where you honed your skills. I mean, nowadays, you know, we take the kids to uh, the gyms and we organize their, you know, their skill development and their work. Uh, but really, you know, you figured out very quickly, you know, you know, if something worked on the playground, it, it's probably going to work in, in organized basketball. Uh, so what I did was, yeah, I, I always stayed, um, you know, from organized inside the gym to either before that or right after that, going back out into the playground and working on different things or just, um, you know, exploring the game of basketball on the, on the playground. If you think about the system that we have in place today with AAU basketball and travel and all the, as you described it, you know, organized, getting kids into the gym and kind of organizers, their, tr their training and doing some of the things that we'll talk about later on the business side. Mm -hmm. And you compare that to the way that you grew up where, yeah, you were playing some organized basketball. You had an opportunity to travel with AAU and that type of thing. But yet you still spent a lot of time playing on the playground. Can you compare the pros and cons of the two systems in your mind and kind of think back to your time when you were 14, 15 years old and what it was like for you versus what it might be like for a 14 or 15 year old in today's basketball world. And just talk a little bit about what you see as the positives and negatives mm -hmm. of the two systems. Well, I, th I think back when, and I guess I'm 40, so I can say back when, uh, <laughs> when, 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 when I played, um, really the, the climate and the environments are, are completely different uh, now than what they were. Um, the ability to go on the playground um, and have different people from different areas of, of the city, different areas of Missouri, you know, all come, you know, into that environment to play pickup basketball. Um, I feel like that uh, allowed me to, you know, to spread my wings. It allowed me to, you know, get more competitive. It allowed me to play against, you know, you know, much older uh, guys uh, than, than, I, than I feel like kids do now, you know, when you make it into the gym. But it, the, the, the climate is different, right? We can go to the playground and, you know, you can be out on the playground for six to eight hours and, you know, mom or dad, you know, they, they you know, figure you'll come home, you know, once the <laughs> games are over, or the lights come on or what have you. So it's just different, right? I, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable dropping my kid off at the playground and say, hey, go work on your game. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of other, you know, parents aren't as well. So, you know, just that relationship of, of having the ability to play playground basketball and experience that. I think, you know, all the older players would say it gave us an advantage. Um, it gave us an advantage of, of knowing how to fight, uh, not wanting to be the last person picked, um, you know, not wanting to lose a game because you, you never know when the next time you're going to get on the court. So all of that is different. Um, but I think there's a plus, you know, on the flip side of that is, is organizing uh, skill development or organizing, you know, how kids prepare and how they work now is that we can help standardize some of the you know, some of the information that they're learning. Uh, and it's not just, you know, try everything, do everything. You can really, you know, be efficient and you can really hone in and lock on, lock in on certain, you know, skills that you want to, you know, excel at. And I think that that's done, you know, mostly in our environment today, in that training environment today that's sure. that's been created. Yeah, I agree. I think that when you look at kids, again, in that 14, 15-year-old range, I think they're exposed to much better coaching at that at that age than kids were back in the time when you were playing or I'm about 10 years older than you so in the time when I was playing I feel like I didn't get exposed to very much good coaching probably until I was in high school mm -hmm. and even in a lot of cases until I got to college and mm -hmm. so I feel like that's something that kids today have a huge advantage in that they get that more advanced higher level coaching at an earlier age and as a result I think kids in general, again, across the board, maybe not at the very top, but I think across the board, kids are more skilled. We've talked with some high school coaches previously on the podcast about how players, let's say 
seven through 12 on a high school roster today are much more skilled than mm -hmm. players seven through 12, 15 or 20 years ago, who I I'll, I'll use this quote a lot where it's like the football guy who was six, two and 225 pounds. would just go in and bang people around and grab some mm -hmm. rebounds. That, that kid almost doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. in, in high school basketball because the skill development piece of it, as you described is so much better. Yeah, I think that I think that's true. Um, you know, growing up, you know, a number of my coaches or the majority of my coaches, I can say growing up were educators. They were in the schools. Like I said, they were principals. They were, you know, in the school system. So, you know, obviously they were focused on, you know, winning and losing, but they had a certain authority, you know, that that I don't feel that the kids get, you know, nowadays. I feel that, the, yes, the coaches are better. There's a lot of a lot more basketball around, you know, you know, guys can log on and, you know, see what different coaches are running and, you know, breakdowns are available. Uh, but do they really care about the kids that they're working with? And I think that that's, uh, you know, an issue that we struggle with as far as to, you know, do we want to win games? Do we want to develop players? Um, you know, there's a balance there of development, you know, and winning uh, and creating these ultimate players like everyone's trying to, to create. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a difficult challenge that everybody in the youth basketball space faces is I think it always comes back to for me. I look at it, Larry, as parent education in the sense that most of the time what I see parents chasing is they'll chase winning records and they're not necessarily chasing the development. They're not necessarily chasing the life lessons. They're not necessarily chasing the mentoring that you're describing that you were able to get a part of when you were a young kid. And that's a thing that I think sometimes is frustrating for people who are trying to do a great job in youth basketball is that parents just see the shiny one loss records that people put out there and they don't always see the entire picture of shaping the whole individual, especially when it comes to youth basketball. Do you see that where you guys are? Uh, we, we do. And I think, you know, and, and that's part of the reason, you know, starting, you know, the BTS program and also the academy uh, is to get, you know, guys like myself. I mean, it's it's a benefit to have, you know, an NBA player, um, you know, per, a person that's played professional basketball uh, involved with this process because, you know, there's a way to, to teach the game. Uh, there's a way to not burst any bubbles as far as to, you know, who's going to make it you know, to the NBA or, or be paid to play uh, basketball, there's a, a, a way to do that. But we can't, you know, we can't forget the fact that the reason why we're here. And I think professional players, you know, understand that there's a very fine line of, of if you're going to make it or not, you know. And when we talk about life skills and character development, um, if you've been in that position, if you've kind of been there, done that, and know um, – that ultimately that's what's going to push you further. That's what a general manager, that's what a coach, that's what a scout is really going to rely on is your character and your in in integrity. If you're going to show up on time to practice, uh, if you're going to, you know, you know, get into your playbook. I mean, all of those things matter. Um, so for me, you know, trying to get as much information out about, you know, what scouts, what college coaches, what general managers are really looking for, um, you know, I feel it'll help the process and it'll help uh, create more well-rounded uh, basketball players. Couldn't agree more. All right, let me, I want to build on what you just said and take it one step further, but maybe take it a little bit backwards too, in the sense that I think what you're describing is that not only do you want to teach basketball, but you want to teach those life skills. You want to teach being on time. You want to teach work ethic. You want to teach character. You want to teach leadership, all those things. And what I always try to get across to people is that, yeah, that's important if you're looking at trying to earn a college scholarship, if you're trying to go from college to the NBA. Those things are really, really important. But they're also important for the kid who maybe tops out as a JV basketball player. If they can learn all those things that you described a minute ago and they can mm -hmm. learn those through basketball, now they can take those things and they can apply them in their life, not just as – a kid trying to get to college to play basketball or a kid trying to make it in professional basketball, but just as a guy going to work every day or someone who's trying to be a good husband or a good, um, you know, a good wife in the case of a female basketball player. I think those things are all really, really important, regardless of where you end up 
from a you know level of play that you attain as a player. No, I, I agree, and I, I feel like you know all of those bells and whistles; those don't necessarily equal uh, wins. You know, even you know if you're, you know, we have a lot of parents that'll look for the best uniform, or you know, or, you know, <laughs> right. or, or some right. sort of championship picture that you know that's being posted and say, hey, I want my kid to join, you know, that program. Well, you know, that's a short-term process, and we like to think of you know all of these young people as long-term projects, right? I mean, you're going to play basketball for a short period of time in your life, and at some at some point in time, you're going to jump into you know, the business world, um, the teamwork space. Uh, we have to work as a group to complete a goal. I mean, at some point in time, you know, you're going to jump into real life. and It's it's much longer than, you know, your basketball career is going to be. No question about that. I think that's something that parents, as you said, sometimes lose sight of is they get attracted by those shiny objects and they see those things and they want to chase them. And that's where I think that if we can continue to educate parents about ultimately what's the mission of youth basketball or what's the mission of our specific youth basketball program, then I think we're going to be better off and we're going to attract the kind of people that are looking for the things that you're describing. We're not going to get every parent. We probably don't want every parent, every kid to be a part of what you guys are doing or what we're doing here. There, there's some people that you may not want to be a part of it because they don't see or have those same values like you described. And I think that's a challenge that's out there for everybody in youth basketball and every youth sport is how do we better educate parents about what the true purpose is of sports, whether that be basketball or something else? And I think that's the that's the real challenge. Uh, I, I agree 100 percent. I agree 100 percent. All right. Now, I want to jump back to when you were first getting into organized basketball. When did you start to realize or get some attention and, and start thinking about, hey, I, I could play this game beyond – where I am now, I could start to think about, I can start to think about college. Maybe I'm even starting to think about having a professional career. What do you remember about that time in your life as those things started to maybe creep in and be a, become a reality for you? Um, I was probably about 14 uh, or 15, um, f- freshman going into, um, you know, a sophomore in high school. I think, a, I think the buzz started, you know, I was a quiet kid, so I really didn't pay attention to a lot of things that were going on around me. Uh, but I think the buzz, you know, kind of started before I went to high school, but I was really, you know, not focused and not, you know, I didn't really know, you know, the direction of, of, you know, where sports could take me, what sports could do for me. You know, I, I learned that really late, you know, <laughs> later on, like I didn't, I was just kind of living and playing basketball and trying to be a good kid. I didn't really have any aspirations or, you know, you know, of making it to college per se at that time. Or Times making, were different you know, too, because without social media and all the internet stuff i think it was a lot more difficult for any kid to know where you stood yeah that 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 is true that is true um but i feel like at 14 or 15 i was probably uh if not the, you know the best kid in the area i was you know you know top two or top three um so that kind of gave you know me, me a little bit of buzz and i was a hometown kid and my high school coach actually um um, left my high school and, and went it to be an assistant coach at St. Louis University. So that was kind of the first, like, okay, there's something after high school. Uh, I know this guy who was coaching me. Now he's a college coach. And, you know, I may have the opportunity to look at, you know, going to that university because I know that coach. Not necessarily because of my ability, but because I knew someone that just, you know, left and took a, a, a coaching job at a university. So 14 or 15, I kind of figured, you know, okay, um, if I keep working at this thing, we'll, we'll see what happens. So as your recruiting goes on, as you get into your junior and senior year of high school, obviously you gain at that point a lot more notoriety and you probably could have gone to just about anywhere you wanted to go in the country. But I know one of the big influences on you and your decision to stay home and, and go to St. Louis was your brother, Justin. So can you talk a little bit about your relationship with him, how important it was at that time in your life and how important it continues to be in your life and how it influences you even today. Oh, well, it, it's a big part. I mean, family is a big part of, of how I operate, you know, how I move, how I, how I carry myself. I always want to keep, you know, my last name uh, in, in the best light uh, as possible because I know that there's a, a huge 
um, you know, a huge reflection on, on who we are, you know, in St. Louis, just overall uh, with, with, with our last name. But my brother was a, a you know, family. My brother, and my mother were, were a huge part of one, me staying and one to be a part of St. Louis University's uh, basketball program. But just overall in general with just, you know, them having the ability, my mother, and my brother having the ability to to watch me play, you know, continue on from from high school. Um, and in that decision, I didn't want to, you know, put any more, you know, problems or struggles on my, my mom and my brother to get to these other places to see me play, uh, because I know that that's that what it will happen if I decide to leave. My brother, and my mother were going to be, you know, right there beside <laughs> me. So. Right. I, I I knew that. And it was a very tough time, um, you know, coming out of high school. So what I was trying to do is I was trying to make it um, as easy as possible on my family um, as I could. And the, the way that I felt um, I could do that is to stay around, stay in town, play basketball, because I knew that they loved to see me play basketball. I knew that that there was a joy there. There was a you know, a release of release of, of stress, you know, when I played and, you know, before and after game. So I knew that and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to represent that. I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, my, my family was there every step of the way. For sure. So for people that aren't aware of your brother's medical situation, can you kind of shed some light on the challenges that he was facing? And then again, that the influence that that had on you and your life? Uh, well, my brother was born with a uh, transposition of the great vessels, which is a, a, a heart defect that you, you have no control over. The, basically, the, you know, your, your heart is, is flipped you know, upside down and it's operating. Um, it's not operating to the full capacity, but it's operating. So he was born with transposition of the great vessels. Um, and we knew at some point he would need a transplant. So that's the, the direction that we were going in, you know, from day one um, is to to do everything in our power to, to make sure that, you know, when the opportunity was there, um, that he would be able to receive a heart and that he could live, you know, a normal life uh, and be productive and do the things that he wanted to do. Um, so he, he had a, a heart transplant at the age of 10. So I was just coming out of high school. I mean, this was a time when, you know, I'm being recruited. Uh, I'm going from practice to the hospitals. Um, I'm in practice getting the call. Uh, that he's now, you know, received his heart and he'll, you know, have a transplant. So with all of that, you know, um, you know, going on, he was a huge just inspiration in, in everything that that I, I did. I understand his struggle. Uh, I saw his fight. Um, I saw that, you know, he's taken, you know, 18 pills, you know, a day. So these are all the things that, you know, motivated me to keep going, no matter, you know, if I was tired or hungry or, you know, sad, you know, th those are the things that kept me motivated. And those are the things that really keep me motivated today um, because I know that he's still watching down and I know that, you know, I have a, you know, I have a, a, a standard to uphold. So, you know, he still motivates me today. Um, and, you know, the family is, is we, we deal with it the, the, the best way we know how, and that's to continue to push forward and that's to be an impact and to do things that uh, we all talked about as a family uh, as we grew up and that's getting back into the community uh, being a, an inspiration to other people, uh, and just being a strong, a strong individual. It's fantastic that you were able to use his very difficult situation and watch out for him and be able to feel that bond that you guys had. And then to be able to carry on his legacy and all the things, the tremendous characteristics that you just described about him to be able to use those to continue to improve yourself, improve your family, and then consequently improve the community around you. I think that there's probably no greater tribute that you could give to Justin than that. Uh, at the time yep. when you were, at the time you were being recruited, did you feel a lot of pressure from outside people to go somewhere other than St. Louis and that were people, I, I'm sure you were hearing a lot of times that St. Louis was below your talent level and so were you hearing a lot of that were you feeling pressure from outside people to kind of try to get you obviously there was a lot of recruiting of from the schools but just outside influences that were saying oh come on Larry you can't go to St. Louis you got to go somewhere bigger yeah no not really I mean um my mother I mean she 
you know shut it down quick yeah she shut everything <laughs> down and I, and I was I was real you know I was I was quiet so I um wasn't necessarily concerned with the big school or a big name or you know this part of the country versus that part of the country uh, I just had one goal is that to you know keep my mom and my little brother happy you know have a chance to play basketball and you know the outside noise was was never really the outside noise because my mom would always she would always protect me, even even to this day. I mean, you know, a lot of people have to call her to get to me, you know, and that's just that's just how it's, it's always been. <laughs> keep that keep that in place. You got to keep yep. that keep keep that in place. Keep people <laughs> keep people on their toes. No, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. All right. Let's let's jump from St. Louis to uh, your NBA career. Talk a little bit about uh, just give us one or two stories of highlights, things that you remember, maybe that are a little bit off the beaten path about your NBA career, because obviously people have followed you, and when they hear your name, they know a lot of the things that you were able to do, but maybe one or two things that are maybe a little bit less known, something that was memorable for you as an NBA player. Well, there are a couple things that are, that are you know, sticks out for me. Uh, one is, is obviously, I, I talk to kids all the time now, and, and they you know, clearly they weren't born, you know, when I was drafted or, you know, or, you know, when I finished even playing basketball, I retired seven years ago. How, str- so, how strange, how strange is that for you? First of all, I, I have a good time with it. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I just think of the guys that when I came into the league, like the guys transitioning out and I didn't know who they were, you know, at the time and I had right. to, you know, talk to them a little bit more to find out who they were. But, you know, for me, it's when I tell people that I played for Golden State and all the eyes just, you know, just light up and, you know, everybody's excited because they, they, they think that it's the Golden State of today. Right. Like, I, I played in Golden State where we, you know, lost 17 games in a row a couple times. Like, <laughs> there, there was months, you know, that we would go and not, you know, win a ball game. So I think that that's, you know, that's funny when you say, when I say Golden State, like, oh, yeah. All right, yeah. And I'm like, exactly. oh, no. But <laughs> for me, it was a good experience because I was able to um, join a group of guys. I had to lead. I had to score. I had to do a lot that helped me, you know, later on in my career uh, playing basketball because I pretty much seen everything by the time I left uh, Golden State. Uh, and then the other one is I was just having this conversation the other day. Uh, is is what did I think of playing with Michael Jordan? Um, and for me, it's it's funny that he he I played with Michael Jordan. But he he actually signed me uh, because he was general manager uh, at the time as well. So not only did I play with him, I was actually picked to play with him because he was the guy that signed me to go to Washington uh, from from Golden State to play with him. Uh, but but really, what I'm getting at is is when I got to Washington. I watched everything that that MJ did. I mean, whether it was, you know, walking in, you know, into his locker, you know, putting his stuff up, you know, having a seat um, to going into the training room to, you know, when he ate pregame, you know, what time he arrived at the arena, uh, what time, you know, how much time he allowed himself to to leave his apartment to arrive at the arena uh, to get his treatment, um, what time he went out to the court to warm up. These are all the things that I'm, you know, just watching um, and, you know, just are, are locked inside of me that I had that experience to watch, you know, the greatest to ever do it, go through his process of, you know, of being a professional basketball player. So those so are two stories that I think are, are pretty cool. All right. Let me follow up the Jordan question uh, with uh, what was one, what was the one thing that w- you would point to that, makes him the greatest ever because obviously there are lots of things that you could point to but what what's one or two things that you're like man this guy is the best because I'm curious to get it I, you know I have my thoughts as a fan who didn't yep. obviously play in the league and and watched him a lot and you know I, I have my things that I think make him the greatest player ever but you as a guy who was in the locker room with him on the floor with him got to know him what what was it that separated him from the best of the best, what made him even one level beyond that? I think his ability to control his competitive spirit. And I say that because, I mean, he's he's probably somewhere right now talking trash to somebody. I mean, he's always, <laughs> he's always giving it to somebody. But he does that. He does it in a way to, to get your reaction. And then he, he makes that adjustment, whether it's playing basketball, whether it's playing cards, whether it's riding a bus, you know, sitting there in a particular seat. 
Like he, he's very competitive, but he keeps it, you know, he doesn't cross the line. He doesn't take it overboard. I think he's, he's being ultra competitive to figure out how he gains his advantage, but he always keeps, you know, a, a level head um, in doing that. It's amazing to me. And I think this is one of the things that always sticks out, not just about Jordan, but just when you look at people who attain tremendous success in any field is just the fact that they're so competitive. And I think in order to get to attain any level, you get to the NBA and every guy who's there is competitive. You don't get to the, you know, you don't get to that level of basketball if you're not competitive. And yet it's clear that Jordan's level of competitiveness took him one step beyond what the normal NBA player did. And that's one of the things that I always, you know, have these arguments with people about Jordan. Is he the greatest? And, you know, I kind of grew up on Jordan, so I'm going to have a hard time ever giving that up. But uh, I just think that he had this ability to, to rise to the moment whenever it was needed. And that's just that mental toughness, I think is what set him apart more than, more than anything else. Yep. I agree. Well, the one question I have is the one thing is if you realize you're one of four people to play with both LeBron and Jordan. Do you know that? I, I did. I, I heard that actually a trivia probably a couple years ago. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it was on TV or not, but one of my, my parents that was playing on a, one of my basketball teams actually brought that up. Yep. Do you know, do you know, so it's Jerry Stackhouse, Scott Williams, Yep. And um, Brendan Haywood. Brendan Haywood. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. That's, yep. that's pretty cool trivia to be a part of, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I think all those guys have, have good stories to tell. I mean, I played with those guys as well. Didn't play much with Scott, uh, but with Stack. I had Stack in Washington and then B. Haywood. He was in Washington as well. Um, and we we definitely have some, some great stories to tell. <laughs> so who's the guy from your NBA time that you're closest with? Um, I'd say that there are a few guys, a few guys that I'm, that I'm actually cl- closest to, uh, Allen Iverson. Uh, we are you know, very good friends. Uh, we actually have been friends way longer than we played, uh, basketball together. Uh, Gilbert Arenas, uh, is, you know, just like a, another brother to me can call him, uh, call on him at, at any time. Uh, and then Jared Jeffries, uh, who went to Indiana, but he was with me in Washington and in New York, uh, who's a character um, in, in itself. And those are just, you know, just three good guys that, you know, at any time, you know, I can pick up the phone and call those guys. Yeah, it's very cool. I think any stop that you have in basketball, when you have teammates and you go through all the things that you go through over the course yeah. of the season, I think that those bonds that get built, they just never go away. And you guys will be 85 years old someday and still be able to call each other on the phone and, yep. you know, reminisce and, and have yep. those stories. All right, before That's we very trans- important. It is. I think people sometimes discount that. And that'll lead to this follow-up question. When you got done and you retired, how difficult was it, A, to walk away and to not be able to have – a season because obviously since the time you were 12 years old and you got into yep. organized basketball you had a basketball season so how difficult was that and then number two how long did it take you to sort of regain your footing and recalibrate your life and start figuring out okay now I'm done playing what am I going to do with the rest of my life had you been thinking about that leading up to retirement or was it boy now I got to figure it out just describe what the retirement process was like for you and then we'll jump yeah. into what you and Rick have going now yeah, well, that process, I mean, it, it started, um, you know, just with me, you know, not wanting to do that road work. And that road work, you know, as a professional basketball player, that's work, waking up at, you know, five o'clock in the morning, you know, getting some sprints in, you know, heading to the gym, uh, getting some strength and conditioning in, uh, getting some shots up, uh, getting some skill work in, uh, playing some competition, three on three, five on five. So for me, when I got tired of, doing that i knew it was time to 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 hang it up um and i i was burnt out you know when i got done playing i didn't play basketball or really shoot basketball for like two years i mean it, it was two years and some change um I, I just felt i was burnt out um and if you know, just just knowing that why i played basketball i played basketball um i mean i i enjoyed playing basketball i was good at basketball but i played basketball for my family i played basketball because you know, like I said, it gave us joy, it gave us peace, 
uh, gave us something to root for, uh, gave us something to, um, you know, be proud of. And when my brother passed, like some of that was gone. Like that joy to play basketball was 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 gone. Um, so I, I knew that and I felt that and I hung around, you know, just a few more years to see, you know, if I would get that 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 joy back. Um, and I never really got it. So I knew for me, like transitioning out of basketball, I knew it was time to do something else um, that I could you know, get those, you know, get those same feelings. But it wasn't, you know, in playing basketball. And I realized as it, you know, as time went on, you know, how much of an impact I could be with teaching the game and helping other people to develop, you know, their skills. And, and that's that passion that, you know, that replaced my playing day uh, passion. So did you realize that right away after you retired that, you know, I, you obviously didn't touch a ball and you weren't playing, but you kind of always have it in the back of your head that the way mm-hmm. I'm going to give back, the way I'm going to use the game that was so good to me is to be able to go back and, and teach kids, or did you kind of go a different route at first and then circle back to basketball? Uh, I, I fell into it. Uh, definitely went a different route. I wanted to, you know, move away from basketball. Uh, went into business, uh, doing uh, women's fitness, uh, which was related to obviously my background and how hard I had to work throughout my NBA career. Uh, but I wanted, to, I wanted to change. I wanted something different. Um, so I, I did, you know, I did go into to business uh, outside of outside of basketball. But I have, you know, I have kids that that play basketball. I have a daughter that's a junior uh, at St. Louis University, um, and my son who's 15 now. So they were playing. Um, they were being coached. They were in different programs around the area. And for me, you know, as a professional player that understands the development process and how, you know, you know, you match fun up, you match skills up, and you match competition up, and you create this 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 energy of, of kids wanting to play basketball and be successful at basketball. So I didn't see my kids getting that. Um, I would go to practices and watch how the process was going. And it was just like, we were just there. Um, so I was a dad in the stands and then a coach, you know, said, Hey, you're not doing anything. You're retired. <laughs> Come on out here and teach this play. So I came out and I taught one play and it ended up, you know, turn it into a basketball academy. There you <laughs> so, go. There so you that's go. how, you know, that's really how it happened. There's still time to register for the final Head Start Basketball Camp of the summer at Brunswick Rec Center. We'll also be having our Summer Skills Challenge at the Strongsville Rec Center on July 29th and 30th. You can find out more information or get registered for both of those events at www.headstartbasketball.com. All right, well, this is a good point, Rick, to bring you in and get you, give you a chance to talk a little bit about your background, and then we'll let you tell the story of how you and Larry got connected, and then from there, we'll dive into what you guys have going today and get into a little bit more detail with that. Sure, sounds good. So, yeah, Larry and I met, uh, I guess, probably five years ago. Um, you know, I, was, uh, I started my career as a, a New York lawyer. Uh, doing merchant and acquisitions and public offerings and you know a lot of finance work uh, in the uh, in the 80s and then in the 90s I pretty much decided that I didn't want to be a, a a lawyer you know working on an hourly wage for the rest of my I mean you make great money and it, it's fun but I wanted to be an owner not you know an advisor so I jumped over to the business side and you know had a fair amount of success building a number of businesses over the years. Um, and generally, the model was you take a smaller business, you build it up to a medium-sized business, and then you sell it to a big business. So I did a lot of, you know, a lot of business sales of businesses that I owned. And Larry and I, you know, I was advising other guys along the way, and uh, a, a relationship that both Larry and I had in New York, young guy, um, introduced the two of us um, when he knew Larry had, you know, an interest in, in building a business, and so. We got to know each other. Um, Larry, you know, spent some time explaining to me, uh, you know, what I call the white space. Um, 
in, in the world of opportunities when you're looking at businesses, you say, okay, where where can you build something where there's a, a real need? And we looked at the youth uh, basketball marketplace, and you know it consisted significantly uh, of a lot of guys with balls in their trunk, you know, going to the local uh, high school gyms and doing some things, and you know, a lot of good guys. I mean, it's not a that, that you know that that's not a slam on guys that are you know run the, that kind of a program, but we saw an opportunity to really build kind of a fundamental sound business that somebody could scale and, and, and you know, spend their life uh, running and building and put their kids in it and have a, you know, sizable, meaning, meaningful business and, you know, uh, doing what we like to say, doing uh, well and doing good at the same time. You're, you know, you're building a program that's helping kids and, and making them peak performers in, in life. And, and, you know, you're making a, you're building a profitable business along the way. So, um, he and I spent a fair amount of time kind of putting all that into Larry and I, you know, spent a fair amount of time putting all that onto a whiteboard and shaking it out and making sure it made sense. Um, and, you know, our, our skill sets married extremely well. You know, I came out of the business side, like I said, New York, I'm, you know, I'm big on the, the financials and the business systems that underlie a business and making sure all that stuff is working uh, the way it needs to. Larry is really strong on the floor. You know, he, he's a mentor to the kids, uh, in a very meaningful way. He understands curriculum so well, you know, that, uh, that, you know, he was able to build a very strong, uh, curriculum that could be rolled out around the country by a lot of people. So, you know, the two of us, uh, our respective strengths, uh, married well. So we launched BTS. Okay. So, when you guys started to come together and put together this idea of BTS, which one did one or the other come first? Did the basketball curriculum piece of it go into place first and then the business side or did they happen concurrently or did you kind of put together the business first? Explain to me the process of how you guys, again, combined your two strengths, what that process was for putting together the business itself from a, both a basketball and a business side? Well, I, I think it happened concurrently because, I mean, the basketball has been around for, you know, for a long time. And, and we didn't want to, you know, reinvent the wheel when we wanted to lay out uh, basketball skill development. Uh, we wanted to standardize the situation and understand, you know, what our young people are learning. That way we can put, you know, a progression path in place for them. So, um you know, and that alongside with the business, of, you know, with the, you know, the ability to communicate. Uh, so I would say that, that those things, you know, w went hand in hand uh, happening at the same time. Completely. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what we would do, you know, we'd spend time um, putting together the curriculum and we brought in a partner when Larry and I decided to do this and we ran the numbers and looked at it from a business side and said, yep, this can make sense. Um uh, there were a couple of underlying tenets. One was um, that there there's a fair number of um, retired NBA players, and you know their their um, you know th their visibility in the marketplace uh, you know has has a shelf life, right? Um, if they just retire and and disappear, you know their their uh, their notoriety starts to to dwindle. So it's great for them to be able to use the value that they've created in their name. I mean, the NBA is one of the, you know, the, the world's most recognized brands, right? And the players in it. So if, if you're a player that's, you know, retired in the last five years, your, your name is still, if you've done a good job, uh, well known in a community. So you can leverage that into a basketball program. So Larry and I started by saying, look, there's a number of guys out there that, um, that could use this tool set to build a sustainable business using their brand. And, you know, it, from an economic standpoint, for me, I'm looking at it and saying, you know, it's great when my partners can, you know, go on to ESPN and get, uh, you know, you're, we're not paying for it like you do in most businesses. They're asking Larry to join and they'll let him, you know, explain the business as long as he's, you know, participating in the discussion of the games that are going on. So it's a, you're really leveraging, you know, your brand as an NBA player effectively in doing that. We thought that that made a lot of sense. So um, we brought in 
you know, I'm, I'm a co-owner in another business that um, I've been involved with for almost 15 years. It's a martial arts company. And we did something somewhat similar there where we built a pro- professional martial arts uh, college. And it, it, there's about 300 schools around the United States and, and Europe that uh, pay to be involved in that program and get the business systems from it. So we've got great partners in uh, the Promac team that that co-own BTS with us. So, uh, you know, what we did, Larry and I started by having the leader of that program, Dave, Dave Kovar. Um, he's got his black belt in 10 different styles, and he travels the world as a speaker in the martial arts space. Um, he's an expert in creating a, a rotating curriculum, which is a curriculum where somebody can slide in. So if you've got, you know, 700 kids in a program, you can't have, you know, kids – that, that means you, you know, you got 20 kids, new kids coming in a week, right? You can't have a coach taking them from the start. They got to be able to slip right into the program. So, you know, Larry and Dave built what we call a rotating curriculum. And I'll let Larry explain that. But, you know, that's a critical kind of it's while it's a basketball piece, it's also very much a business piece. All right. So, Larry, talk about that. But before you do, I want to ask one question, and that is when you guys set out initially, or I guess maybe this is more directed towards Larry, because I'm guessing you had the basketball academy idea initially come to you rather than go through Rick. So when you first had the idea of, I'm going to put together an academy, did you have the thought of, I want to do one location, impact my local community here in St. Louis, and build that business? Or did you initially think, I want to be able to scale this thing, grow it. Maybe there's some other NBA guys that I know that would be interested in doing this same thing. Or did it just start out as you wanting to run a program yourself? No, I think a lot of the guys are in the same position that, that I was in. I mean, I, I've sponsored teams and, and sent teams on, you know, road trips and uh, pay for hotels and pay for uniforms and pay for shoes. Um, you know, all that being said, you know, what was the impact? Um and I think a lot of guys get into that is that, you know, at some point in time, that, that money is going to run out as far as what you're, you know, you're sponsoring that team. So what, what sort of impact are you really making? And when I started this, this, the skill part of the, you know, of the academy, it was about making sure that if our, if the athletes are going to play on the weekend, then they must do two skill sessions during that week. And that's pretty much how we built, you know, the program around, you know, skill development, and and then you know your team player your games so gotcha. that was that was the focus gotcha all right so explain to us rick mentioned there the rotating curriculum talk to us about what that means for people who aren't familiar with that term including myself explain to me what that means so what that is we always cover our, our core skills which is your ball handling your shooting uh, your defense your passing and we have agility um you know mixed in, in into that process so what we like to do is we like to each week uh, we, we, we run on five week uh, testing cycles and the, there's 10 of those in, in the in the calendar year. Um, so the course of those 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 five weeks, uh, we have a focus of basketball. We have excuse me, a focus of ball handling. We have a focus of uh, shooting and we have a focus of defense passing. Um, so with that, we go three weeks of focus skill development. So you're focusing on if we're talking about ball hang that first week. And we're working on in and out dribble. So for that entire week, that is our focus. Obviously, we're always working on our other skills, but we know when we walk in the gym that week and we're doing ball handling, our main focus is our in and out dribble. We're going to put as many drills to that skill as we can and as many drills as your skill set allows you um, to participate in. So the first week is your ball handling, your second week is your shooting, your third week is your passing. Your fourth week, we're going to review that information. So we're going to review that information and what we're looking for if if you have the understanding of that skill. So we understand that athletes at a, a, a different range of skill levels, uh, body movement, some of them are still growing, some of them don't know, you know where their left foot is because they're growing so fast. So what we want to understand is, is do they understand that skill well enough to eventually master that skill do they understand that skill enough well well enough to apply that skill so in that fourth week that's when we're going through review to make sure that those athletes understand that skill and on our fifth week we're testing on you know those skills that we went through for those first three weeks 
and we're reviewing, you know, excuse me, after, after that, we're, we're having those tests. So those tests, do those tests then allow a player to advance to the next level or how does that work? So let's say, you know, again, I'm sure you have kids of all different age ranges. So if I have a kid who's nine and then I have another kid who's 13, how are you handling those different ages, those different skill levels? And then does the testing allow the kid to advance to a new skill level? Or how does it, how do they move through the entire program? They do. So what that does, so we have a shirt uh, progression and we also have a star progression. So if, if you're that, you know, just starting out in the academy and you go through your first five weeks, uh, you understand all of those skills. Uh, you're in a white shirt, uh, which is our, our starting academy shirt. So after that five weeks, you're able to complete those tasks and you would get a star. OK, so that next week, you know, that that next testing cycle, you again complete that cycle. You would get another star. And eventually, once you accumulate four stars, you're going to move to a different shirt color. So what that shirt color and what those stars do is it opens up your toolbox. So laid out in our curriculum, we have, you know, how the different skills match up with the stars and also the shirts. So as you move up in shirt color, you now unlock, you know, that two ball dribble. You now right. unlock, you know, that between the legs, behind the back, inside out combo move. You now start to unlock those things as they grow within the program, as they grow from stars to, to shirts is, is, is how we look at it. All right. I get it. So that makes a lot of sense to me as kids are going through and they're mastering the skills, you're testing them on those skills. And then that allows them to advance and continue to grow and, and improve as a player. So yep. Rick, from your, from your side of that, what does that look like from a business system point of view in terms of how do you handle registering, keeping track of making sure that all that is running smoothly so that the coaches that are out on the floor can be in the best position to help those kids at the skill level where they're at, which is obviously the ultimate goal is to meet the kids where they are to help them advance beyond that point where they might be right at the moment and get to that next level. Yeah. So, you know, Microsoft, we used to do a lot of Microsoft deals and they have a, a well-known saying that you got to eat your own dog food. So we train our developers a lot like we train our kids. So our developers have a blue, a red and a black shirt. So, um, the, the way the program works from a, from a finance side, when we built this, we looked at it and said, okay, you know, what does the, uh, developer to kid ratio need to be to give the kids an effective, uh, experience that's going to train them properly, but not, you know, cost us, uh, you know, at a point where we can't drive to profitability because you got your fixed costs, your variable costs, you know, and, and you got to manage those, right? So, so um, our developers are by and large part-time people that have day jobs and just love training kids. So, you know, uh, we, we do have some full-time that really drive managing uh, the training of those developers. So as Larry mentioned, we've got shirt colors that you progress from a white shirt, no surprise, to a black shirt, um, you know, along about a three-year cycle. And... Um, we try to do a, we try to have a one to ten developer to kid ratio, and so inside of the development process for the kids, you've got um, fundamental, intermediate, and advanced. And as they get through their shirt colors, we uh, we can more effectively train them. So if you've got you know a bunch of kids in a red shirt, you get the right developer over there with a red shirt kid, so that they're all pretty much you know um, at, at a similar level. You got, you know, the the white shirt kids, you can use some of your younger developers that you have in training to, to, to you know, develop them. So from a business standpoint, we're able to, you know, assign the assets, if you will, uh, properly to, you know, to the various kids on the court to make sure that their experience is, you know, the best it can be. And we do a lot of training in things that are not just basketball related. So we want to make sure they, they understand the curriculum we have you know, online training tools that we make, you know, for every five week cycle, guys got to go into what we call Moodle, which is a very popular platform for, you know, the education space for online educational training and, and review the tapes and the, and the videos and the videos are not just basketball videos, but they're things like praise, correct praise and smile and sweat and learning and the way you interact with kids. We, we have the, you know, three touch rule where we want to make sure that, 
they use the kid's name and give them some advice at least, you know, three times during a session so that there's the proper kind of interaction. So there's a lot that goes into making sure that the, the experience is a fabulous experience um, for, for those kids. Because at the end of the day, you know, from a business standpoint, it's about retention. If a kid stays for two months, you know, that that's not the kind of kid you can affect. Like Larry started by saying in the early go, one of the differences he thought from his youth was he had educators there that, you know, spent a lot of time with him and character development being a critical part of what you want to do. The longer those kids stay with them, with us, the, you know, the more we can influence them. So um, all those things that we're doing on the floor influence the family and the kids because, you know, every parent every month is saying, you know, how can I manage? I got three kids. They're all too busy. I got to give something up. We always want to be the program where they say, that's the one we're not giving up. They're too important to us. They do too many good things for my kid. So describe how you incorporate those life lessons, those the character building, all that stuff. Describe how you build that into your curri- curriculum. Because I have a pretty good understanding of what it is that you do from a basketball side uh, with the colors and the stars and that type of thing. How do you then build in – with your with your coaches with your developers how do you build in those character lessons those life lessons that you want kids to take away so that you are that program that people don't want to give up so i'll i'll start by kind of giving you one of the business tools that we use i'm going to hand it off to larry cuz he's he's the guy that really sees that that floor does what it's supposed to do and has built the program around that so a couple of things we do with the developers to make sure that the character development uh, um, char- characteristics that we want to talk about are, you know, are properly addressed and, and addressed in the right way. We have what we call huddle discussions. So at the beginning of every session, we pull all the developers together for just a couple of minutes, remind them of PCP, uh, you know, the three touch rule, the character uh, development trait for that for that um, cycle. And, you know, so we gear them up. Um, but I'll hand it off to Larry to kind of explain how we make sure that those are getting implemented with the families and with the kids. Well, well, yeah, what we do is we make sure that that's, you know, that's posted just like your ball handling skill is posted. So for, for a week that we have integrity as, as, as a character focus, that word is posted just like an in and out dribble. Uh, That word is posted just like, um, you know, your post pass. So with that is we, we're always making sure that our, our developers are communicating the, you know, those character focuses to our, our, our young athletes, uh, whether that be an example um, from, from their standpoint of what integrity means to them, or um, once you give them the definition of what integrity means, or we like to you know, have the kids raise their hand to, to do you know, Q&A, who can tell us what integrity means, and then we talk about you know, what does integrity mean to you. Know, you. Um, you know, and we go around, you know, that that huddle class asking, you know, what does integrity mean to you? So now they're all putting their own interpretation of or their own, you know, life experience to what integrity means. And we feel that that's, you know, more meaningful than, you know, just you know, giving it give, giving that to them from our vantage point. You know, we really uh, bring our young people in to have them understand, you know, perseverance, um, you know, hard work, uh, what success really means. These are things that we're having conversations with the young people. So they're not just listening. They're also participating. How much better do the kids get at that type of conversation after they've been with you for six months, a year, a year and a half, two years? How much better do they get at those conversations? Because I would imagine at first when a kid comes in, they, they may not be comfortable with that. Yep. But that's what we use the buddy system. Um, you know, any any of our new uh, athletes that are coming in, we, we try to group them with, you know, someone that's been there. Um, we really uh, promote our young people that have been with the program uh, to be leaders. Um, so, you know, at any given time, we'll call on them um, to, to, to break that ice. But it's really using, you know, our peer engagement to make sure that everyone, you know, you know is, is having the best experience that they can have. We don't want to call anybody out or single anyone out, but we want to make sure that, the, you know, that people, when they come into our gym, the athletes that are that have already been there, that have spent that time, that have gone through the curriculum, you know, they know, you know, you know what's going on and what it appears, you know, 
what makes the most sense is to the parents, you know, that brought the young person in to see that that engagement is going on. You know, that that helps a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I think by being able to engage parents, I know we talked about that back at the very beginning. To me, that's one of the key things to being able to develop a successful program is you get parents to buy in because you educate them about what the value is that you're bringing day in and day out with whatever it is that you're that you're doing. So this is a question that both of you guys can answer. Uh, where are you guys right now in terms of what you ultimately envision VTS becoming? Where are you in that overall process of executing your vision? And then what do you eventually hope to see BTS become or do in terms of locations, in terms of impact, in terms of geographical spread? Just talk to us about what you see, where you are right now, and then where you see the business heading as we move forward. Well, for me on the basketball side, is I'm really interested in, in standardizing the development process. Um, and I understand that there's you know no real right or wrong way. I mean, players have been developed um, you know in a in a a uh, military style environment that they've also been developed in in, in, in not so much. Uh, but for me, I think that uh, the information I believe that the information that we have, uh, the years of experience, the different coaches uh, that we've been around, um, you know the different events that we go to, I think we have a really good opportunity to um, lay out our curriculum, you know, have people understand how we develop. Um, you know, all these kids are going to move at their own pace, uh, but there's a process in place uh, to help them. You know, in in every step of the way. Um, that's my, you know, that that's my ultimate goal, and that's what I'm I'm most concerned uh, about. Again, because that affects uh, the young people that are playing the game that you know that that I love to play. Rick, from your perspective, where do you see it going? Larry's obviously focused on the kids that are in front of him that he's working with on the court that he's trying to make an impact on, and you're more on the business side of it. So do you guys, do you see, Rick, where you're going to partner up with more former NBA players in a variety of cities? What's your, What's the future look like for BTS? How are you going to get what you do into – other markets into other places into other people's hands so that you can continue to grow the business so you know uh, the business side if, if you were to divide it up with that, that and the core side are really symbiotic I mean because as Larry says he wants to have consistent training uh, uh, and really that you know that's coffee shops before Starbucks and coffee and then Starbucks right when you walk into Starbucks, you know what you're going to get, and it's a popular place because you know no matter which one you go to, you're going to get that same quality that you got someplace else. So those systems Larry talks about, from the underlying business systems to how you collect the, you know, the the, the money every month to you know how you deliver the quality on the floor to the you know the style of the facility to the things that you're providing that consistency is required just from a business standpoint as well. So, you know, they, they, they fit well together. If you can leverage that then with the brand of NBA players, um, that, you know, that's, that's a trajectory for the business that we're very excited about. So we got, you know, Chris Paul's facility. We, we, we uh, run in Winston-Salem with, you know, with Chris's team. Um, we've got three or four other NBA players who will remain unnamed right now that we're in active discussions with about signing them up and their territories and the way BTS generally works is when we go into a territory with somebody we'll be the exclusive for them so we won't provide BTS services to anybody within a radius around their facility so they know they've got our full-time attention and with that um, we've just launched you know we just opened Larry's facility we've been running this operation for three years until we got this facility up and, and run them because it was about making sure we built the right facility at the right price um, and with the right tools. And some of those tools in his facility are technology. So we're using technology in St. Louis with Larry's facility that are being used by um, several NBA teams in their training facilities. One is called Respect, and that is a shooting technology that tracks um, your your ball shooting from location arc where it goes in the basket we track all that we have another company called it respects out of israel um, and they're with uh, nine nba teams and they'll be with five more before the end of this year 
Um, then there's another company called Connexon, which um, has a sensor that you, you hook to your shirt or your pants and your torso area. Um, and they track your speed, uh, your jump height, um, your metabolism. They track everything. And so Larry, when we open Larry's facility, we have the Connexon Respect System and all that stuff goes into the digital locker of that individual. So now you can imagine the gamification you can create with that. So you become a member of the 500 Shot Club, 1000 Shot Club, and you use that for the shirt progression as well. Now you got a lot of objective data that you can use for the shirt progression in the Families love it because they can see the progress, you know, and they can see where Johnny's shooting from, you know, the way it looks now and how well he's doing now versus how well he did, you know, months ago. So that technology is, a, in, in our view, a real differentiator that can really help us progress those kids. So you guys are kind of ahead of, a, ahead of the curve when it comes to that technology piece because there's a lot of great technology that the NBA and college teams are, are using that hasn't necessarily trickled down into the youth basketball space. How long, Rick, do you think it is before the technology piece becomes, right now I think it's, novelty is the wrong word, but what I mean by that is that people don't necessarily expect there to be technology associated with youth basketball. How long do you see, as a business guy kind of looking forward, how long do you see it being until that technology is not a novelty, but rather it's expected when I walk into a youth basketball program, if they don't have this technology, that's going to be the oddity as opposed to now. I think it's probably the people that do have the technology that are the oddities. Yeah, well, it, it's like so many things, you know, uh, when it happens, it happens very fast. I like to equate it to, you know, you're you're old enough to remember black and white TVs, uh, maybe sure. barely. But, no, but, I remember. You know, I remember well. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you went to color TV, and, you know, once you start watching a color TV, you kind of don't want to watch black and white TV anymore. Um, and we're finding the same thing with the technology. Once you start tracking and seeing the progress and being able to look at all those details about what's happening in terms of your progress, to go play without it is just is not nearly as much fun. Half the kids will take, you know, three times more shots now because they're trying to get a perfect – 100 score, you know, when, when your ball goes through the net just the right way in the respect system, it, it, you can get 100, and it's hard to get. And so they keep shooting. And, and you know, so now it's not just making the basket, it's making the perfect basket. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so we think it's going to, the adoption is going to happen fast. I think it's about driving down costs. And, you know, you want to be an early adopter because there's a lot to integrating into your system. You can't just open up a facility, drop in some technology and make it all work. When you got 50 kids walking in and you got to assign those sensors to them and, and you got to do it within five minutes because they're only there for an hour, you know, it, there's a lot of business systems that are wrapped around that. So we decided to adopt early and become one of the leaders in the space because there's a lot more than just, you know, hooking up to a sensor. It's about the whole experience, getting in, having a great experience, getting great coach coaches, you know, with, with the kind of activities we talked about earlier. And then, you know, all that data gets collected and it's in your digital locker. You, mom and dad, can look at it anytime you want. No question about that. Guys, I want to be respectful of your time and start to wrap up here by giving you guys a chance to share how people can reach out to you, find out more about what you're doing with BTS, what you're doing with the academy there in St. Louis, Larry, and find out more about your business and what you guys are up to. So, if you guys would each share out how people can reach out to you, find out more about what you're doing, and if there's anything else that we didn't hit on in the last hour that you want to share before we get out of here, go ahead and do that as well. Uh, no, for, for you know the, the St. Louis operation, it's it's lhbastl.com is is our website, and the team, the staff, they do a great job of making sure that you know, everything about our academy, everything, you know, you know, the things that we're doing, uh, the things that are up and coming um, is on that website. So, you know, that's the, 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 the best place to go, in, in my opinion, is lhbastl.com. Uh, Perfect. We'll throw that in the show notes too, Larry, so people can find that. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, as far as if somebody's interested in BTS and saying, you know, I'd like to build an academy in my area and I want to learn more. Um, you can go to basketballtrainingsystems.com, and there's a lot of information there. Um, we're in the process of building a summit 
where we're going to invite a number of people that you know have some interest in learning how to build a, a program out to St. Louis in, in late September. So you know you can stay tuned for more information on that. We've got some blogs uh, that we've launched on the on the site, and there'll be more information there about the summit and you know how you can learn more about BTS. Um, you know there and info at be, uh, basketballtrainingsystems.com is where you can send emails and one of our staff will respond fantastic guys we can't thank you enough for spending an hour with us tonight it's been a pleasure to talk to both of you and to everyone out there we will catch you on our next episode thanks head start basketball's player development academy offers cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills regardless of a player's age skill level or position Training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls ages 4 and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.